Hello and welcome to Miniature Realms and welcome to another update in my 10mm Walls of the Roses project. So this is project vlog number four. I um, just wanted to give you a little update since um, I last put a video out talking about the project. Um, so I've been quite busy working on lots of different projects at the moment, including working on um, lots of work and getting my, my kids been off over the summer holidays and things as well. So my own personal hobby time has been a little bit shorter at times, but this project has worked out quite nicely for that. A lot of it has been reading so far and then when I am able to do some painting I'm just able to do a, a couple of stands of the smaller infantry which is still progress um, but it's something I can complete within a, within a relatively short period of time which has been quite nice. So since the last video I've finished reading Tewkesbury Eclipse of the House of Lancaster by Stephen Goodchild. Um, really really enjoyed it. It's a really really easy read. Um, there's not an overwhelming sort of amount of information in there which some historical texts can be if you're just dipping in as a war gamer. Um, I really do love to get in depth on history. I don't always have the time especially when I've got three or four war gaming projects all on the go and I want to do different bits of reading. That's why things like Osprey books are so good but I actually found this in many ways more accessible than, than some of the Osprey books. As much as they are easy to read there's often an awful lot of, of, of information packed in there and, and um, yeah I just like the way it's read anyway so I do recommend it if you uh, are looking at Tewkesbury or he's, he's done a couple of the other battles as well. I think Barnet and, and something else so it's definitely worth looking at his um, publications. It didn't give me the information I was hoping for um, in terms of maybe numbers of artillery and uh, um, and where the handgunners and, and maybe mercenaries uh, had come from and whether they were how many French were there if there were any there that kind of thing. It's all a little bit vague but I suspect that's just the period and we've seen that already um, in things I've discussed before. Um, it's, it's a little bit vague at times and we don't have a full order of battles. Um, so I was continuing to, to kind of research that area and I was googling and I was googling things like how much artillery at Battle of Tewkesbury etc etc and I came across this publication so this is Blood and Roses now this is um a, it was just a PDF hosted on its own or the, the the Google search found the the host for this PDF to download and I downloaded it and it was um it's, it's for from a, a game called Blood and Roses by GMT Games by the looks of things and I've, I've not come across it before but it's a hex based game hex based sort of battle game it actually looks, looks really really interesting now I'm not going to go out and buy the game and, and play it because um, because I like my miniatures too much to be honest with you there's a reason why I don't play though many of those kind of games um, if, I can, if I'm going to play a battle game I, I really want miniatures to be on the table that's just the way I like it but this book seemed quite interesting now I don't know whether I've not gone searching for for um, <laughs> knockoff PDFs of, of rules here. This is looks like the official thing, and I think it was hosted by them. But I won't post the link just in case it has been hosted by a third party. Um, but um, if, you, if you're interested in it, you can be able to go and, and Google it and, and find it for yourselves. But the battle book basically looks like a series of scenarios for the game, um, and included in that was Tewkesbury. Um, and it was quite useful. I mean, there's a little bit of history that's, um, you know, it's going to be very vague compared to um, things I've been reading in the, in the Stephen Goodchild book, for example. But if you're a war gamer, the small kind of tiny little introductory history is actually more than you need in many ways. Um, there's a like a battle map layout designed for that game, which is, you know, not really relevant. But it can give you a little bit of an idea about deployment and, and the sort of the size of the battlefield you may need. So it's handy to a point. Um, and then there were two kind of order of battles and obviously designed for the game but um, they did tend to reflect what I've read as well so I, they're, they're not a million miles off so I went and cross-referenced what I was planning and what I had in my head with with what was what was there and you can see it there on the screen now obviously they they split their longbow and their standard infantry off into separate things rather than the mixed bill and bow units that I'm using um, but um, I thought it was quite good and they've, one of the things that was found quite useful is, is that they, for the Lancastrians it shows one artillery, whatever one artillery means, um, and for each of the for the battles and for the Yorkists two artillery for each of the battles. Um, and I look it up at the makeup of, of the amount of guns I was thinking about having on the table, that probably <laughs> probably transfers quite well. So for now, unless I read up and find anything different, I'm going to plan on having one artillery piece, so one one gun, one stand of guns um, for each battle of the Lancastrians and two each of the Yorkists. That's based purely on seeing this. 
Um, I did look at some of the other things, looking at the dismounted men at arms. It does, does look like most of the most of the main uh, vanguards have got um, two um, units of mount, uh, men at arms versus one and the others. So I I have um, decided to up that amount a little bit from the spreadsheet sort of screenshots that I showed you last time. Um, which yeah, which brings me on to to those. So this is my kind of updated plan as it stands. Um, I'll put them both on the screen at the same time. So each of those cells relates to one unit. So if you look at the Yorkists and you look at um, Gloucester's um, Vanward, um, you've got a two Bill and Bow, one Men at Arms, two Artillery and one Handgunners. And I think the Handgunners I'd have as a small unit and the rest would all be regular and the Artillery would be one one of each gun, so it'd be two guns for that one. Then the main ward for Edwards with, with Duke of Clarence, he's got two Bill and Bow, two men at arms, two artillery and a handgunners. And then Hastings has got two Bill and Bow, one men at arms, two artillery, and no handgunners. And then we know about the small unit of mounted spears that were off to, off on the flank. Um, and that's, you know, three decent sized battles with more than enough troops to kind of to be within that division in terms of the house uh, caesar rules um and i think that's a good starting point i may well decide to go back and almost double up on everything because there's nothing nothing saying you can do that and have even more knights and nobles represented on the battlefield but because the sides are quite even you can definitely um you know <laughs> use them the way that they're displayed here and i'll you know any feedback on that um please do Put something in the comments below and um, if you can see the Lancastrians there are very very similar almost identical apart from um, the amount of artillery and uh, and they don't have any of the, uh, the, the, the the cavalry bits so maybe need to balance that out a little bit we'll, I'll, I'll look at it but they're close enough for me so that's the plan so that's pretty much the game planning. So my bit of historical reading and, and, and planning my purchases and things. Because of those changes, I have gone and done my next order with Pendrack, and it's a very, very small one. It's it's a couple more sets of men at arms to bolster out the ones that I've already got um, and, to, um, and to give me two extra full units and then a couple of packs of handgunners um, to use across both armies. And then for Tewkesbury, I've got everything I need. Um, when I go on to fight other battles, when I expand the project into other battles, which is what I'll plan to do after this, I will um, no doubt go back and buy more cavalry, buy some long spears or pikes or something like that, and uh, have some you know proper Burgundian troops and things. If anyone does know where the handgunners that are in both armies were likely to have come from, please do let me know. I haven't come across it yet in my, my research, but I do have some things to read. I kind of figure they might be French or Burgundian or something, um, but I'd be interested to know if anyone knows for certain where they're likely to come from. I think Edward might have had some Burgundians with him for when he came back with Gloucester. Um, but also you'd expect um, that... Um, Margaret of Anjou would have potentially had some French troops with her as well. So I'll be interested if, if people now are sort of leaning towards some French handgunners for her and some Burgundians for him, but that may be wrong for this battle. Um, and then other than that, I think I might have touched on these in the last um, the last vlog, but I did finish off Colin Igledon's um, Wars of the Roses series. I think I was nearly finished the final book last time. Really, really, really enjoyed them. The second half of the, the fourth book is a little strange. Well, not in, I wouldn't even say half. I felt like it ran out of um, ran out of pace a little bit when we got to kind of um, Richard the Third and then Bosworth. It felt like it maybe should have been a fifth book and spent more time on it. It's still good, but it, it was definitely just, I felt like the story had been told and it was like a very large addendum at the end, that sort of section of it. Um, but anyway, maybe that's just the way the, the book deal worked for him, but I definitely recommend them. There are obviously historical liberties and things taken, but uh, if you like a bit of historical fiction to underpin your proper historical reading when you're delving into a project like the idea it just helps me have a bit of a flavor of the period in my head then I would definitely recommend those and I've nearly finished the first of Toby Clement's um, books um, the Kingmaker series Winter Pilgrims um, and it's same period but from a very very different point of view from the point of view of commoners um, and it's um, 
got a much more kind of sharp feel to it in that sense where it's focused on smaller men lower down in the ranks rather than the big names the big names are there but it's not told from their viewpoint whereas the con um the colin eagledon ones definitely are so i would definitely recommend those and i'm really enjoying the first one so far but anyway that's what i've been listening to novel wise while i've been painting and let's show you what i've been painting so here we are so I've worked on the first two units of guns I think I said in the last vlog that that's what I would do and um, so I decided to opt for the prone uh, um, firing bridges and bases for the warlord do for bolt action um, I tried some square bases I tried some oblong the other way around some rectangle ones and tried some round ones but then they were too big to fit everything on and they were about the same size as I wanted to use for my command bases so I tried these out and they just work really well for for one gun um, so that's what I went with so you don't seem to have anyone with a, a, like a ramrod or sponge or anything like that so i don't know that's not part of the kit i don't know if that would have been something i, I kind of feel it would have been um but um you've got your fire pit you've got the, a man with a smoking brand you've got uh, someone aiming or spotting or looking bewildered whichever way you want to look at it um and a guy with a bucket um which is the guy at the back there has a little bucket but i've painted them up um with edward's livery these ones anyway, anyway I think I'm going to put him in his battle I think that's the battle I'm going to finish first um, but when I get around to painting some more I will mix the liveries up a little bit as well obviously the old guy here has got just got his own, own stuff on there um, but they, they were really really easy to paint um, I did the same method as I did for the previous ones so black prime grey zenithor then white dry brush um, and then after that just use contrast paint and then highlight it on the contrast paint after that just one layer um, and that was all that was needed for a, a 10 millimeter model and i think they look quite nice all based up um, i'll put a couple of stills up as well so you can see them um, um, but yeah thanks for listening to me ramble again i think the plan next time and i've already primed them ready is to work on edward's command stand um, I probably should do another bill and bow unit or something like that but uh, it's far more interesting to do a command stand so I thought I'll do that and it'll be a nice thing to show you in the next vlog as well because um, we're then slowly getting through all the different types of units that I'll be painting for this project and by that time then the handgunners will have probably arrived and maybe I'll do a handgunners unit after that um, and then I will have painted all of the, the five different types that will make up in this battle at least oh apart from the the, the, cat, the small amount of cavalry but we'll see about that later but anyway thanks very much for watching please do like share and subscribe and i'll catch you soon